Um, uh, Julia DeCola, if you could kick us off. So I'm Julia DeCola. Um, the, I am a resident of downtown Bridgeport. So I guess my apartment's my favorite spot downtown Bridgeport. <laughs> But I, uh, but I also enjoy going to Ralph and Rich's as well as to uh, Joseph's Steakhouse. And uh, so those are places that I uh, truly in enjoy going to. Um, I am the um, board chair of Optimus Healthcare, uh, which is uh, headquarters at um, uh, 982 East Main Street. And uh, we have about 30 odd different locations throughout Bridgeport and the surrounding communities, including Stanford. We have um, approximately 50,000 Bridgeport residents as patients and provide uh, over 200,000 uh, medical, unique medical visits a year in the community. Thank you. And uh, next up is Crystal Ingram. Good evening, everyone. My name is Crystal Ingram. I'm the Human Resource Director and EEO Director for Greater Bridgeport Transit. Uh, my favorite place downtown is oddly the bus terminal <laughs> because uh, I spend a lot of time down there supporting our staff. And my favorite place to uh, dine is Ralph and Riches. Um, that's about all I have. Thank all you. Right. Thank you and a very important member of the Bridgeport Rotary, I think, as well. Yes, I'm the immediate past president of um, the Bridgeport Rotary Club. Great. Um, and I believe uh, uh, Chef Mona Jackson is having some issues uh, logging in, so we're trying to troubleshoot that right now, but um, I'll ask Natalie Price to introduce herself. Thank you for having me. I'm Natalie Price. I'm a business and career strategist. I own a couple of businesses downtown, Priceless Consulting, the Collab Exchange led by us. That's all entities that I run and operate downtown. And I inspire intentional action in my clients by teaching them how to strategically position themselves by using their transferable skill sets to navigate opportunities with an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, I'm excited to be here today and looking forward to hearing all these great lady stories. Thanks, Natalie. And um, move on to Lucy Teixeira. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I am uh, Lucy Teixeira. I work for Aquarium Water Company, I'm the vice president of administration. Um, so I have responsibilities for um, IT, HR, customer services, and corporate communications. And um, it's, I grew up in Bridgeport, so I went to school there. I remember downtown when I was a little girl, you know, the Woolworths and um, the Reeds, and it's a terrific place. Um, and I'm really delighted to see that it's being really built up again um, to be like it used to be. Um, and I love the Aquarian building. If you've never seen it, uh, reach out to me. I'm happy to give you a tour. It's just beautiful. Um, and I love Ralph and Riches because I just love food and they have terrific food. Uh, but there's so many great things, you know, the, the Barnum Museum, which is opening up soon again. I look forward to seeing that um, once again. And, um, you know, I'm just blessed to um, have grown up in the city and to have worked there for my entire career. Um, so I, I look forward to, uh, you know, great things to come. Great. Thank you. And then we'll, uh, I guess, walk around the hallway in the Aquarium building over to Bernadine Vendita ah. from Junior Achievement. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you for having me be a part of this exciting, fun night. Um, my name is Bernadine Vendito, and I am the president of Junior Achievement of Greater Fairfield County. And what we really do is show kids a path from education to careers and, um, and really their success. So in addition to one of my, my favorite place where we are housed throughout wonderful, generous landlords at Aquarian, which I love the building. Um, my other favorite place is McLeavy Green um, because in the summer, which we haven't been there in a while, but I just love the farmer's market and the music and just, just seeing just so many different people converge. I just love that part of it. Thank you. Thanks. So these are our wonderful panelists, and I'll hand it back to Erin to get going with our question and answer. 
Thanks, Lauren. Um, and when Chef Mona is available, we'll have her introduce her, herself as well. But uh, on to our first question. So we're celebrating Women's History Month. Um, let's talk about the relevance of Women's History Month to each of our panelists. Why is it important to you? Why is it important to celebrate uh, this month and, and make this a big deal? So uh, Julia, um, start with you. <clears throat> Well, um, it is a big deal. Um, you know, women offer and have contributed to many, many great uh, aspects of our society historically and, uh, and often are not recognized for it. I mean, the history books are filled with men uh, who have done this and done that and, and not nearly as much has been attributed to, um, to the great things that many women in, in our history have done uh, for civilization. Um, it, for me, it's in, uh, and, and, and also I should say even currently, uh, women, there are many great leaders in our society and in the business world who are women, and we have not historically been uh, recognized as such. Um, often, often we are, you know, considered to be, um, you know, in competition with men, but we're not. We're just, we're, we're not in competition. We're just doing the job that we're that we're designed to do or or want to do, I should say. And for me, the there is a personal significance to it also because <clears throat> I am a transgender woman, and uh, to be um, to be so, uh, selected and part of this panel as a as a woman of Bridgeport is a very very significant um, um, goal for me or um, or you know, a milestone in my life that I greatly, greatly appreciate that. Thanks, Julia. Crystal, why is it important to celebrate Women's History Month? Uh, why is it important to you? She's muted. You're on mute, Crystal. I think it's important and it's important to me because we need to appreciate our moments of praise. Um, we, as women, don't get um, our moments of praise very often, especially if you compare it to um, the men and their accolades. So it's extremely important um, for that reason. It's extremely important for us to celebrate each other. Um, I think the fact that we can gather and celebrate each other and perhaps even start a um, cohort of support um, amongst each other is really important. So my hope is that um, this panel discussion and everyone who's attending will establish an ongoing relationship um, because we're all connected and there's room for all of us um, to, to grow and to inspire each other. So that's why it's important to me. Thanks, Crystal. Uh, Natalie, go ahead. I think Women's History Month is really important to us because it allows us to reflect on, uh, despite the barriers, what we've been able to accomplish as women. However, it also brings awareness that we have much work to do um, to ensure that we meet pay equity requirements that we need as women, to make sure there's equity for business owners that are minority business owners in marginalized communities, and to make sure that black and brown women receipts on their businesses are higher than as many businesses that are formed. So as, as, as wonderful as it is to have a Women's History Month and one that we recognize, it also brings awareness as why we have to have it is because we're not paying, because these major issues are not being looked at. So we have to champion that. So there's there's goods and bads of why we have it. And I think they both have to be acknowledged so that we continue to move on and continue the hard work that we have in front of us. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, Lucy. Um, I agree with everything that everyone said. Um, I think it's important to recognize the past accomplishments of uh, you know, what women have done to get us where we are today. Um, it's important to celebrate that. Um, and I also think it's important for us to encourage um, each other, um, as well as our um, children, our, our, our daughters, our, our nieces, our, um, you know, the young, young women in, in society today um, to push them along and say, you know, you can accomplish your dreams and, and have a seat at the table. Thanks, Lucy and Bernadine. 
So um, really, I the same. I agree with everything that we heard. And what I would add to that is that by celebrating those accomplishments, they're important to do because they give voice and voice is equal to strength. And that's what I really think it is. And then that is really important to do, as you said, Lucy, to be role models. I know for my own daughters and for the young women that come you know, behind us and up to help lift each other up. So that's what I would add to it. That's why it's so important to me. Thanks all. And that's a great uh, transition to our next couple of questions. Uh, you know, speaking about role models and people who inspire, um, what women were influential in your life and inspired you and helped you find your voice? Um, let's start off with Crystal. So there, there are so many women who have inspired me, but the three that I would like to highlight in particular um, would be my grandmother. My grandmother was, um, she's, she's passed on, but she was a established businesswoman um, in the 70s and she owned her own data processing company, a hotel, a pizzeria, a florist. Um, so she, she was awesome and she taught me how to um, think big. And um, she, there's, there's a phrase that I, I recently picked up, um, to be humble like a flower, um, and, but like a bomb. So um, that's what I learned from my, my grandmother. My mother inspired me. She inspires me to this day. Um, my mother has uh, triumphed over uh, different challenges in her life. And um, she inspired me to, to be strong as well. And then we have my daughter. My daughter uh, inspires me daily. My daughter is a social worker. I'm uh, HR. So um, as an HR person, I deal with a lot of challenges during the day and I come home to a social worker who helps me deal with those challenges. So those are the three women that I'd like to highlight. That's beautiful, thank you. Um, Natalie, you'll pick it up from here. So of course my foundation is built by my mother and my grandmothers. Um, so that's just a given for me, no matter what but I have a list of women that have inspired me and I'm just gonna go through it really quick. Second grade, it was Miss Rogers because she worked really hard with me to push me forward. Second grade was a pivotal year for me. I stayed back. So you, you, know, you have voices in your head and I always say the voices in our head are created when we were, when we were young. Um, Miss Rogers pushed me forward. When I got to high school, it was Miss Leeds because I was told by my guidance counselor that I was not college material. And Miss Leeds was like a, she was the intern guidance counselor at the time. And she worked with me rigorously to make sure that I got into Central Connecticut State University. And then when I got into there, Pat Gardner was my admission counselor. And she like held my hand and made sure that I was okay. I worked in the a student, um, the vice president's office of with work, you know, like a work study program. And it was Miss Monica Johnson. And she was like a mom on campus to me. Then I moved back home and I find myself in this city called Bridgeport. And I met Miss Deborah Cavanis. And Miss Cavanis gave me my foundation as an entrepreneur, um, very much have her style. And as I am building my business, I really find my mentorship, Miss Kim Bianca William. So I, I had to go back and take, and take notes to where women have helped me throughout my life, the significant places. And those are the, the women that have really driven me um, to where I am now. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, and Lucy, if you would add to that. Sure. Um, so similar to Crystal and Natalie, um, my grandmother was my first role model. Um, we, we come from Portugal and um, my grandmother raised six kids on her own. My grandfather passed away when my mom was just one years old. And uh, she actually, she ran a farm uh, very successfully. So she was sort of my, the first entrepreneur. And I learned so much from her because um, she taught me how to 
uh, work really hard and to overcome uh, challenges and, and still be successful. Um, secondly, um, we immigrated to the United States when I was five years old, so I had to learn how to speak English and um, went through the Bridgeport school system. So all the teachers really uh, along the way that worked with me to understand um, how to read and, um, and to grow, you know, as an individual. Um, and then when I came to Aquarian Water Company, um, it was Janet Hansen, who was the only woman executive um, at Aquarian, and um, she really encouraged uh, me to, um, to grow in the organization. Um, and she became the first uh, president of the water utility. So, um, you know, all three of those women, all of these women really have been impactful in my life. And I thank them for that. Wonderful. So always, always have to wonderful to have people ahead of you to look forward Absolutely. to your career. And we'll actually talk more about that um, in just a minute, but I'd love to hear from, from Bernadine. Thank you. Uh, so the, the pers first person is my mom. And the reason is that my mom um, grew up, had a very difficult, hard life. And as kids, we had really um, big financial challenges and struggles. And the thing about it though, is throughout it all, she taught us a really, she taught me to have a really good work ethic. And then beyond that, a sense of humor, which it serves is so important to have. And then the other thing was being authentic, um, just being who you are. That was so important to me. So that, you know, my mother had no education, really didn't have opportunity, but with what she gave to me, it drove me to pursue education and make a better life for myself. And, and then for my kids, hopefully. The other person that stands out to me is when I started with JA, there were many challenges we'll talk about later, but there was one of our board members who became my mentor and friend. And she was a gay woman um, who was uh, second in line to become CEO of a global company. Kudos to her because she ended up leaving and became CEO of another company. Um, and what she taught me was Really in leadership, there was great compassion for other people, um, making decisions. You got, she used to say, you'll make 10 and just hope seven are right. And it's okay to make mistakes. The other thing, she was always willing to roll her sleeves up. She was never too good to do that. And you really do need grit and hard work. And then giving back. Um, it really showed me that, um, what, it, what it was like in watching a person who was truly philanthropic. And those were really the two that stand out for me the most. Fantastic. Sounds like wonderful women. Um, and Julia, if you'll wrap us up on this question. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, like the other women in the panel, I certainly, uh, I certainly include my mother as somebody who has very much influenced my life. My mother never met Julia though, and uh, passed away before Julia became. And um, so, but she, but her influence is always part of my life. Um, it currently, I shouldn't say currently, but, but in reality, there are three women uh, in my life as Julia who are the most influential. And uh, first and foremost, it's my sister Doretta. Uh, my sister has taught me so much about, um, about, well, acceptance about love. Um, she demonstrates a and has taught me the values of, of being uh, quiet confidence, which she exudes all the time. She has unwavering uh, perseverance um, and um, resilient strength and um, an uncompromised grace. And these are all things that I don't think I necessarily had in my previous life. But, I've, but as a role model, she has given these to me. Um, other people who are very much important to me in my life and, and, are, uh, and have helped me become the person that I am uh, is um, Virginia Han Hanrahan, who, uh, who, was a, who had faith in me, was the first uh, woman uh, of, of significance that accepted me for who I am, uh, somebody I didn't have any knowledge of the nonprofit industry, and she taught me just about everything that I know by having faith in me. And, um, and finally, uh, Reverend Sarah Smith is very, very important in my life. 
Uh, she's um, given me a base of faith uh, to live by, and she has taught me what's, um, what being a strong leader and a figure in the community is all about. Without these three women in my life, I don't know that I would be here today, to be perfectly frank with you. Thank you. Yeah, we, we survived by our strong sisterhood, I think, many, many times. Erin, um, I'll pass it back to you. Sure, and Julia, you are your your support system is here for you. I see Doretta and Virginia both here, so <laughs> you certainly got a strong support system. Uh, yeah, that's it. They're buying me a drink later, so. <laughs> <laughs> Chef Mona has joined us. Thank you so much for being here, uh, Chef Mona. If you could give us a quick introduction of you, um, just tell us about who you are, what what organization. Um, you have, and uh, any fun facts about you? <laughs> a lot of fun facts. Um, I'm Chef Mona, CEO of an um, organization, um, nonprofit um, called Cook, um, which is located downtown Bridgeport. Um, we have been in existence now for 12 years, um, children um, and adults, um, healthy um, eating and cooking. Great, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so our, we're gonna jump into our next question. Uh, tell us a little bit about your journey as a woman in business and what advice do you have for a woman starting her career? So uh, Chef Mona, we'll start with you. <laughs> okay, in, in journey, um, over the years, I started out in paralegal. I am a paralegal um, in my other life. Like I like to say, journeys worked in corporate, but my passion has always been in food. When I decided to go to culinary school, much later on, I knew that's what I wanted to do. My dad was a very big influence over me as far as cooking um, was concerned. He was a army and he had his own catering business. And I remember him used to say she went to culinary school, but during that time, um, black men um, were families and going to work and you know, um, that wasn't a thing for, for them, but I have always loved to cook. And his, I had two aunts who were his sisters who were very, very powerful. Um, they, my, my father and mother, they were from the South and created up here to the North. And my mom worked in, in a factory raising kids and I'm the youngest of them and um, seeing struggle to go to work every single day. I mean, if we were poor, we didn't know it. You know, it was a fun time. We, we, we had everything that we needed. So, and my mom and my aunts always said, you can, you can do what you want to do in life. Because things will change over the over the years, over the generations, um, things have changed dramatically. For women. I have a woman vice president, so if things haven't changed, then I don't know what else there could be. There could be so much more. And each day that women get involved and and go after their passion and. And that I have to and to own my own business. I did the gamut of, of women and, and working in corporate and working in law, but it, it got, got me to now where I am, am founder and CEO of Cook and Grow. And it all was, was a vision. So I'm supposed to be right where I'm at today. Thank you, Mona. And that uh, 
what you said certainly hits home. We've come so far, but we still have so far to go. Oh, uh, yeah. We definitely do. We definitely do. But we'll make it there because, I mean, we're, we're the mothers of the earth. So we will get there. Thank you, Natalie. The, who, uh, the next generation. Yeah. Yes. Natalie, uh, tell us about your career journey and what advice you would have for a woman starting out in her career. So I've had, in my short career life, I've had two careers because I worked in a corporate setting. I worked at Pratt & Whitney where I got to see airplane engines be, be made and I got to give tours to foreign dignitaries through fact degrees and everything. I worked at Wells Fargo and that was right at the housing crisis when everybody's houses were going upside down and all that good stuff. Then I moved back down. I was in East Hartford and I moved back down here. But no matter what job I got, I knew at 17, I was gonna be an entrepreneur. I just didn't know what I was gonna do. I knew that my, my journey in life was to inspire others. I just didn't know what the testimony was. I was like, well, I don't know what I'm gonna be talking about, but there's something in me that just tells me that my journey is to be an entrepreneur. And a part of that journey, I'm going to pick up some skills that are gonna help people move things forward. That's the basis of what I knew. And then um, in 2009, I was laid off. I had graduated from Central Connecticut State in 2005. I worked at Target, I worked at Wells Fargo, I worked at so many different places. And then I was laid off from Wells Fargo. I moved back down to Connecticut. I mean, down, back down to the Fairfield County part of Connecticut. I needed a place to live that was cheap. Bridgeport met that requirement. And I moved to Bridgeport and in Bridgeport is where I started my business. I went to the city council and I sat in Deborah Cavanis's office and I was a sponge. I just absorbed things. I always tell people if I was an innate object, it would be a sponge. I sit. I listen, I absorb, and I'm very strategic in that. I think the, the, the advice that I give everybody is start to be intentional about the actions that you take in your career. Be intentional about the opportunities that you see. Know what skills and what value you can extract from that opportunity. Know what skills and value you bring to that opportunity. Remember that you're, the places that you work, they your nine to five, they are, it's an arrangement, right? So. I have a lot of people that, you know, come to me as clients and they, you know, my job could be doing more. My thing could be doing more. It's an arrangement. And just be clear on the arrangements and the value you bring to any organization. Never be afraid to continuously educate yourself. You can do that for free online. YouTube is the number one teacher. And you can go through different people. If you don't like how this one says Excel, you can go to 10 other people how they teach Excel. <laughs> I think that we need to be more intentional about how we develop ourselves as professionals, as uh, whether that's in our career or as business owners. I no longer convince people to be entrepreneurs because entrepreneurship is a mindset. And that's a voice that's deep down within you that you have to know that you want to do that. We can't convince you that, yeah, go ahead and be an entrepreneur. That's something that you have to want. But I believe that working for people and having a job is no, it's just as important as entrepreneurship. And if you can't give your all to somebody that you work for, you may not be able to be an entrepreneur. So <laughs> that's my little uh, nugget of jewels that I give all of you as you are moving through your career. But really, really, really plan, set goals. When you set a goal, set tasks, understand what those tasks are, set ba ba boundaries with people um, as you are building out that plan and always, always be intentional in the next opportunity. Thanks, Natalie. Lucy, tell us about your journey and uh, any advice that you have. Uh, well, my journey, um, like I, I mentioned, I've been with a crayon for 30 years. So right out of college, that was my first job. I was an accountant. Um, I did that for seven years and um, I hope I don't offend any accountants on this call, but it got kind of boring for me um so just when i was getting ready to you know think about doing other things that uh, a job became available in human resources and um the company gave me an opportunity to use my skills um, and develop uh into uh some hr roles which um i really enjoyed um i really 
realized that I missed uh, the people side of things. I like to help people. Um, and then I just kind of grew uh, through the organization um, into customer services and, and IT. Um, and it's been a, a tremendous opportunity for me because I really enjoyed um, all of the different aspects of, of the business, whether it's dealing with employees and helping them out, mentoring them, um, helping customers that have issues with um, paying their bills or um, you know, working with employees uh, within the organization to help them advance in their careers. Um, so I've been very lucky uh, that I've been able to really love what I do each and every day. Um, and that's really the advice that I have for people is um, really try to uh, love what you do. That makes a whole lot of difference in um, the energy that you bring to, um, to your role. Um, I often tell my kids, um, you know, don't be afraid to fail. You know, uh, you learn so much about yourself uh, when you sometimes don't succeed. Um, you learn to be resilient. Um, and I also tell them, like uh, what I just said about, you know, when, you, when you're working, try to love what you do. If you don't love it, change it, try to change it. And if you can't change it, then leave it um, and find something that's going to make you happy uh, where you can contribute uh, your energy because you really spend most of your waking hours working, right? And if, um, it always amazes me how sometimes people are not happy and sad and, and they don't have the courage to make a change. Um, so don't be afraid to fail. And then lastly, I think uh, you know, surround yourself with people that have different perspectives because you really become so much stronger. Um, and you know, when when we look at across the table at the people that work with us, we really try to bring people that have different perspectives, different experiences, because that will um, make you um, a stronger leader. You, you see things from different lenses um, that really. Um, are incredible for, for me. I always say, you know, whether I work with Peter or others that some of my colleagues that might be on this call is that they all bring such perspective and, and I learn a lot from them. Um, so that's the advice that I have. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, Bernadine, tell us about your journey. My journey. So um, when I started out, I started out um, in business and I thought that's what I like to do. And then when I had children, I decided to stay home and raise my kids. And while I did that, I didn't even realize, like Natalie said, I always knew what I wanted to do. I don't think I always knew that, to be honest. Um, and so then what happened was I, I just knew that I, want, I had a passion for, I had a passion for people. I always did connecting with people in a meaningful way. It's been a passion, which leads me to where I am now. But with that, and along with, I had a passion for fitness. And so I was taking, um, when I was pregnant, classes, and then I said, I can do this. And I just went out and I started a business doing it. And through that, I built so many relationships and friendships, which, which is just a benefit by the side. Um, and then I did personal training. And as my kids got older and they were back in school, it gave me different opportunities. And fast forward a little, it led me to an opportunity at Junior Achievement, which I really didn't know what it was, to be honest with you. I just knew that it was interacting with people and, and a board. And I thought, oh, I love to do that. And so I talk about on my journey, I think my biggest growth, my biggest challenge, my biggest difficulties in every way culminate in my junior achievement experience. I've been there 15 years, um, president for 12, and I can tell you it's overcoming obstacles and turning lemons into lemonade doesn't happen alone. Um, there, are, I had gone into this position um, without experience in fundraising, without experience in running a nonprofit. I really had none. And a, a just quick funny story. I remember my first board meeting um, that I was at, I was, I was going, I, I accepted, I was going to be president. And um, I knew that one of the senior people on the staff had said, well, if she becomes president, I'm leaving. And, and I knew that a lot of the board at that time didn't really, I had no experience. So do you know what it's like to walk into a room and you have to own it, but you know that you probably only have about 10% support. And I remember thinking, okay, what do I do with this? And I was so scared and so frightened, but I put on the best leopard shoes I had and a great suit. And I walked up to that podium and I, 
I faked it, you know, and it felt good because I did that. And what I would say is, with, and another experience was in the boardroom. And those of you familiar with Aquarian, um, the boardroom is a wonderful, it's just a beautiful building. And there's these portraits of men all over the place, white middle-aged men. And at that time, our board was mostly white middle-aged men. And again, no experience, you know, and I go and I went a few minutes before a board meeting and I sat in the, in the spot where you can look at the door. And I thought to myself, as fearful and as difficult as this is, I'm here at the table. And that is what drove me is that I was there um, really transferring life skills. As you said, Natalie, so many of the skills I had, I had to transfer, have to be willing to um, have grit and do the work and team, um, be willing to um, learn, be willingness to ask for help, um, build a network of support. That was incredible for me. And, and like I said, I can't separate that from my personal growth because you cannot go through experiences like this and not have fear and not have um, change that happens that is so, so amazing. And that's, that's really important. Um, I think I would say self-compassion. We tend to look at all the things, oh no, I didn't do this, I, I don't know. If you have self-compassion first, you're able to be so much more compassionate to others, compassionate to others, and not be so self-judgmental. Um, you don't know what you don't know. And, and I would say that is one piece of advice to young women and going in, realize you don't know what you don't know. Advocate for yourself is really important. It's a journey. Um, life is a journey. It, it's, it all comes together and I feel like that is so important. And just to end it, I just heard um, Oprah uh, last week, I was listening to something and she said, when I started my career, I kept thinking, I want to be like Barbara Walters. And then she said a light bulb went off and I realized, no, I didn't have to be Barbara Walters. I just needed to be the best version of myself. So that is my journey. And that is what I would say to every person every young person. I wish I learned it long ago. It's okay to make mistakes. Life's a journey. Enjoy the ride. Thanks, Bernadine. Uh, Julia, tell us about your journey and any advice you have. Ditto to what, to what all the other women said. Just simply ditto uh, because it's all great advice. And I think that uh, our journeys are very similar Although, having said that, I, I think I have a unique perspective uh, from the fact that um, I have two journeys uh, that went on. One was my journey into womanhood, which has, and that coincided with a, brand, a journey into a brand new life uh, per, ad, profession, if you would, and that's working within the nonprofits. And, um, you know, in my previous life, I um, was in the business community in the business world for a better part of um, 35 plus years. Uh, most of that in the Wall Street um, uh, arena. And that's a very different lifestyle than, um, than you know, being in the nonprofit community. They're, they're, when you're in the Wall Street arena, you're not thinking about helping other people or wanting to uh, better the community around you. You're only thinking about one thing. And it's uh, so it's a very different thing. When I started my uh, journey into womanhood, um, all of a sudden my eyes opened up to what's really out there and where the deficiencies are. And, you know, and I looked at those that were helping the community and the ways that they went about helping them. And, um, and I remember that, and I think this is the advice that I'll offer, and, and Bernadine sort of uh, touched on it also. Um, the thing that I recall was that I showed up as a volunteer in uh, various committees or, or in um, um, work opportunities. And though I did not have the experience I relied on um, the same attitude that I had as far as my journey into womanhood. I didn't start my life as a woman, but I'm here now, and I'm going to live that way, and, I have, and um, I'm going to, you know, have a right to live this way. And I felt the same way about um, my venture into this new world, uh, in, into the nonprofit world. I'm here. 
I'm sitting at this table. I'm willing to work. Let me work and, and prove my worth. And I did. And, uh, and I networked. And I think that's uh, whether it's in the nonprofit world or in the commercial world, you have to be able to network into the community and those around you that are influential. And I wound up um, getting a couple of breaks here and there and, um, and served um, in, in capacities that, quite frankly, I didn't have the formal training for. But I relied on my uh, business experience uh, and my life experience to guide me through that. And I was a fast learner and I had some very good teachers who were very patient uh, with me. And, um, and that's where I am today. I, I feel that, um, that the advice that the ladies, that each of the ladies have given is absolutely spot on and unique to their particular circumstances, but they kind of all overlap on one another. And I think that's what I'm trying to offer also that you need to have conviction in yourself, belief in yourself, and know that you, and as Bernadine says, I'm sitting at the table. I have a right to be here, and I'm just going to work. And, that's, and, and I think that that's important no matter where you are in your career. And that's the way do I approach everything I do in my life. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Crystal, tell us about your journey and any advice you have. So my journey, um... I'll start with high school. In high school, I went to, um, I'm originally from New York. So in, I went to a business school and I studied legal studies. I, I wanted to be an attorney and then I changed my mind. Um, I worked in healthcare administration for some years. Um, I had a, I started a master's degree for um, teaching health education and promotion. And I abandoned that degree because I realized that um, you needed to have some clinical background in order to promote health. Um, I interned in public relations. Um, so I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to work around people. I wanted to be able to share my shine with people. And hence, human resource um, being a human resource director allows me to do all of that because I work with, um, I, I provide legal representation without being an attorney for um, the Greater Bridgeport Transit, um, healthcare administration, I do benefits, um, teaching, I do leadership and development, public relations, I'm out in the community, whether it's promoting the transit authority or another any other organization that I'm a part of and so I just created my own path uh, I didn't know at the time that that's what was happening but I get to do everything that I felt I was interested in from high school and that's important because I do a job um, that I love I have a career that I love and I can contribute to the community I can contribute to someone's life every day, um, which is very important to me. I start my day off um, with a prayer, ask, um, asking, um, asking God to show me to, how to be a blessing to someone and for someone to be a blessing to me. Um, I, Natalie mentioned about being intentional. I think it's very important for all of us to be intentional in the work that we do be intentional not only to the people that we serve, but be intentional to our, ourselves. Um, being intentional to yourself and encouraging yourself. And um, someone else mentioned, I believe Lucy may have mentioned about doing, the, doing what you love. It's very important and knowing um, that you're getting up and doing something that's rewarding to someone and, and rewarding to you as well. Um, I also want the advice that I want to give is to um, follow your vision. Don't follow someone else's vision. Have a vision for yourself. Um, it, there's a big difference in um, you saying you're at the pinnacle of your career than having someone else say you're at the pinnacle of your career. Don't let anyone put limits on you. Um, and if that's the case, if someone says that to you, that should fuel your fire. Um, because it, it happened to me. 
So you're not at the pinnacle of your career because someone says so. You're at the pinnacle of the, your career because you say so. Um, so I believe in creating your own vision, sharing your shine, um, appreciate your moments of praise um, and, and have a humble boldness about yourself. Um, there's, there's a way and, and we, need to be, we need to be bold, but we need to be humble and bold. And that's the advice that I would give. Thank you. Very good. Well, thank you to everyone. Um, we're having such a wonderful, robust conversation. I think we, we had planned for a, a COVID question, but you know, really who wants to talk more about COVID at this point? <laughs> um, we, we would invite you and welcome you to join one of our breakout rooms um, after the Q&A is over if you really wanna dig into everybody's lived experience with, with the pandemic. Um, so I'll just hop to our final question and then we'll take some questions from, from the audience after that. Uh, but just to wrap it up, we'd love to invite our panelists to tell us about their current venture or current ventures, if that's the case, um, and how this community can support you and how we can all stay in touch. Um, so I'll ask Natalie to start us off. Hey, let me take this. All right, so I have a lot going on. I had to make a list because I don't always do this and I have to get better at doing this. Uh, so I, I own the CoLab Exchange downtown Bridgeport and for the summer, I'm turning it into a summer bookstore slash the night market, right? I love collaborating with our community. So I reached out to Feed, I reached out to Discovery Museum, I reached out to the zoo, I'm reaching out to local authors and all this. And we have a big shipment of books coming in for the $5 book sale. So that's gonna start in May. We'll feature different coffee distributors, different, all that good stuff. So that's, I call the collab, if I was an artist, this is where I get to draw. I can't draw, but I can create business models. And I just consider that to be art, don't judge me. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then on the other thing we are doing, I believe in collaborating to reduce expenses as professionals and business owners. So I have photo shoots taking place in the month of April. If anybody wants to get their photo shoot done, 45 minutes, $125, you get three poses and you get to have like four different locations. Erin is going to do hers in the sanctuary. She picked her spot. So I'm very excited about that. And that's just a part of collaborating to reduce an expense. All right. I will put that website in the, in the chat. So if you guys are interested, the next thing I'm really proud of is I got my first really, 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 really big contract. And that's with my company led by us. We are going to be creating an equity and justice action commission for the city of Norwalk. So it's a one year contract. I am very excited. I know this is really new framework um, that we get to uh, address. So I'm excited about being able to build that out. And with Priceless Consulting, which is the foundation of which all this began, I am going to be launching what I call is the careerpreneur, which is a cross between entrepreneurship and your career, because like, is your work your business or your business your work? I think it's one and the same. And I'm going to be launching that come September. So just pay attention. I'll be out there. Thank you. So much going on indeed. All right. Well, uh, Lucy, if you could tell us about uh, your going ventures, how to stay in touch and how to support. Okay. Um, well, there's a lot going on at Aquarian. So we are um, really working hard to grow our business um, and expand. Uh, we're working hard to uh, serve our customers. Um, many have been uh, impacted by the COVID-19. By COVID so trying to communicate with them about uh, payment programs to assist them and working with um, agencies like Operation Fuel to uh, give them assistance if they need it. Um, we're working on really um, uh, implementing technology across the business to communicate uh, more effectively with customers, opening up different channels of communication. Um, and that's where you know people like Peter um, are really great with uh, helping us deliver um, our, uh, you know, our message to the customers in the best way possible. Um, and I would really love to um, get to know all of you uh, better. Um, I am at 835 Main Street. Um, if you want to catch up with, uh, with me for some coffee, um, I'd like to get to know you all a little bit better. I do know Crystal from our days at Rotary Club, but um, I must admit that I don't know, uh, and I know Bernadette 
briefly, um, but I'd love to get to know all of you a little bit more. Um, and if I can help uh, with your businesses and whether it's, um, you know, advancing it through our organization or helping you through some, you know, corporate contributions, um, I'm glad to consider that as well. Fantastic, thank you. And that's such critical work at this time. So many people are in need of support for, for basic utilities. So thank you for all that you're doing. Um, Bernadine, again, down the hallway from, uh, yes. from, <laughs> from Lucy. Gratefully so. And we, you can come and have coffee with Lucy and we can all join together. That's the easy that part. That would be great. <laughs> yes. So for, for me, current is junior achievement. And like I said before, what we really do is work with the kids in, this, in school, not in the classroom now, but virtually um, providing opportunities and role models to really show them a path from education to the workforce. And, and really how to be successful. There's so much work that we do. I, I think it'd be wonderful if you could visit our website, which is www.jagfc.org and see the different opportunities we have. Um, one in particular that we're really, really excited about, we're about to launch on May 4th. We call it JA Inspire Virtual. It is an amazing um, event. We are, um, it, it, it actually looks like a um, conference center where kids will come and then there will be all different businesses by industry so that kids can really have um, a real good understanding of the different careers and paths possible from education all the way through um, to the workforce. So um, we always need sponsorship support. We always need um, role models and engagement, but I'd love to tell you more about that. So please visit the website or like um, Lucy said, come on over to 835 Main Street and um, we'd love to tell you more about getting engaged with that. Wonderful. And as a current and recent JA volunteer, I can say it's just a wonderful experience. It's really very gratifying. The students are amazing and, and the team to support. I see Twanda's here and a couple others. So uh, it's a great community to join. Um, Julia, you can tell us how to support and what you're up to and all the other parts. Okay, well, um, you know, right now, um, a lot of my time and effort is wrapped up in um, the uh, board work that I do as um, chair of Optimus. Uh, Optimus is a very large organization. There's a lot going on, and it's a lot of work. And, you know, and it's a volunteer position, too, of being on the board, as you all know. And um, and Optimus, I think the challenge is that, um, op that the healthcare community has, and uh, not only Optimus, but Southwest and other commun health, um, uh, community health centers have, is that we're in a COVID world right at the moment, and all of our, uh, a lot of our attention is focused in on the delivery of services in the COVID world, uh, the testing, and now the vaccines, and so on and so forth. So it's a tricky moment, and, and it's tricky because we have to deal with the realities of today, but we also know that the future isn't that far away, that we need to get back to business as normal, and part of business as normal is, is uh, providing services to our community. Also, what's, very, um, what, what's on all of our minds is, you know, what is the future going to be? How are we going to evolve into the future as far as the type of services, and there's every likelihood that there's going to be expansion of services uh, and, um, and, you know, into different areas and not just the clinical things that we, that healthcare uh, centers offer right now. We could be, uh, could be offering a lot more social services in the future, and that seems to be the model going forward. So we have a very delicate balance of, of, of dealing with today's realities and planning for the future. And that just occupies a lot of my time right at the moment. And I'm, I'm very happy. I love what I'm doing. Uh, it, seems like, it seems like my entire life was waiting for this moment. And uh, it's arrived and I um, I'm in, um, threw myself into it with, uh, with a great deal of zeal and passion. Thank you. Um, and Crystal, if you could tell us, um, 
how to support you, what's going on, and, uh, and what else? Okay, so there's a lot going on, as with everyone else who has spoken, um, and opportunity often knocks softly. I realize that. Um, and we have to know what's an opportunity and what is time consuming, what's an investment. So um, I'm trying to choose what I involve myself with very carefully. Time is precious. And I think this past year has really um, highlighted the fact that we need to treasure our time and, and our, our friends and family and so forth. With that said, um, I have accepted an invitation to be, to uh, be serve an executive role on, a, on two boards within the community. I'm on the training team for um, our Rotary District um, and we're recruiting at GBT constantly. Um, so that's keeping me busy in, in, in addition to being a volunteer and a mentor. Uh, with that said, I'm also trying to find more time for myself. And I think that's very important. We've heard a lot about the contributions that um, the panelists are making to the community and to the work that they do. Um, the word of advice that I would give everyone is to take time for yourself. Very often we forget about ourselves and we, we need to um, invest in ourselves. Um, so with that said, I put my contact in my, my contact information in the chat. I'm looking for a hobby. So if anyone could suggest a hobby, reach out to me because with all the work that we do, we need a hobby. We need you want to come roller skating with me. You can come to collab. Yeah. I roller skated today all around the collab. I had a blast. <laughs> I'll, I'll start. I'll start with you. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I can afford to break anything, but um, we could try it out. So anyone who has a hobby that they can introduce me to, call me. Thank you. Great. I see a bunch of suggestions already coming, coming into the chat. And thank you for that so important reminder that we need, our time is finite and very valuable. Um, so Chef Mona, someone who embodies community spirit, uh, please tell us about how we can support you, how to stay in touch and you know all that is going on. Well, um, I need all the support, the parents from, from the adults um, about investing in, in their children's future and investing in your their children's health and cook and grow. We're here. We're we're right downtown. Um, you hop in if you want to check us out, and hopefully that there will be students there, and you can see what what they're doing and how they feel um, about the program. Uh, I just you know by word of mouth of people people talk, talking about there's a place that. Kids can have an outlet besides um, playing video games or all. Learn their life skill. Learn how to to cook. You know, um, I mean, cooking is life. You know, if you don't eat, you know, you starve yourself. You know how to eat and to cook correctly in something that is fun that you love to do. Right here at 1042 Broad Street. Thank you. And as a past event attendee, I can tell you the food is good and <laughs> the time is fun. <laughs> so <Thank you. laughs> um, look forward to many more dinners out on the Peacock Alley once we can get back to life as normal. Um, but yeah. I'll, pass yeah. <laughs> I'll pass it back to Erin um, to close us out. Yeah, thanks so much, Lauren. Um, we will take questions from the audience uh, for either all of the panelists or one in particular. But first, I want to say again, thank you so much to our panelists for being here, for sharing your time with, with us, for sharing your experience and your expertise. It's just been so delightful to hear all of your different experiences. Um, and thank you to our sponsors, 
uh, Aquarian, uh, Yale New Haven Health, Bridgeport Hospital, and Bigelow T. Thank you very much for your support um, and for allowing us to do such a wonderful event to, to highlight these women. Um, so do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, you can raise your hand, you can uh, unmute yourself and announce that you have a question, but feel free to jump in. Hi, this is Virginia. <laughs> Hi, Virginia, go ahead. I don't know who to um, send this question out to everybody, but one of the things that I discovered was I worked in Bridgeport off and on for years in my career. I've discovered a wonderful community. There are small businesses um, sprinkled throughout the city. There are wonderful um, places to eat. I mean, there's a bakery right downtown called Laisha's. Um, there, there's a fine Italian, there's every, everything you can imagine. And one of the things that I think is a shame is the, the outskirts outside of Bridgeport all often say, um, you know, what's in Bridgeport? We don't go to Bridgeport. And I think, I think that, you know, all, you all are invested in the city in some small way, at least, at the very least. And I, and I believe that um, there should be greater outreach into the suburbs, into other towns and, and ways of bringing people in because it's rich, utterly rich in so many different ways. It's a beautiful place in, in many ways. I, I wondered if any of the panelists have ideas about how to do that. Um, several, several of you, are invested in cooking or food or nutrition. Um, some of you are working with the youth in your community. And I just, I just think it's a shame that there's such a, 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 a great divide, so to speak. Um, I've often thought that there should be, you know, uh, some type of marathon through Bridgeport or, um, maybe a 5K, doesn't have to be a marathon, um, or something that would bring more visitors uh, so that it is it opens itself up to the wider Connecticut area because it's unbelievable in, in so many different ways. The architecture is great. The people are wonderful. The, the restaurants, the stores, I, I, I'm repeating myself. So I put that out to all of you on the panel. Well, Virginia, uh, funny that you mentioned that 5K. We are cooking something up at the BRBC and in the city. Uh, Yahoo! Something along those lines. So, so keep that in mind. Keep that on your radar. But Natalie looks fired up about this question. I'm so I'm so give ready to answer this question. So I'm going to tell you a story about Bridgeport. First, I do not believe in, in outside in uh, community. I believe that we have to get Bridgeport loving itself. If, you oh, look at the history, if we look at the history of Bridgeport, right. I consider it to be kind of like an abuse victim. It's been used, brownfield, taken advantage of, stripped of everything, and then just given back to us and say, hey, make something of it, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're abused and constantly used and played in all kinds of ways, you don't make clear decisions. No, it's a trauma victim. It's, it's a trauma, <laughs> it's, right? So, so, so I no. want us to think about that. And I want, I want you to think about the amount of years, right? And it's not just Bridgeport, we are dealing with, it, it's a larger economic problem that you will see in every suburban community throughout, mm -hmm. I mean, urban and mar urban. marginalized community, right? So mm -hmm. it's bigger than just Bridgeport. But I don't believe that we need to go knocking on Fairfield and Westport and all those doors and say, please come to Bridgeport. I believe that we have like 148,000 people that we need to re-engage into the city of Bridgeport and remind them that it's theirs and that they need to participate. When we want to talk about self-love, self-community love, that starts with self, right? It's the community. So so I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I definitely, and, and I definitely do not believe in trying to get people to come here. I believe that we need to get our community supporting outward, supporting mm -hmm. the past, making it work within. You know, it's just like this. If everybody's talking junk about your house, are you, is anybody going to want to go for dinner? No. no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a juicy community. It's, it's unbelievable. Yes. Julia, go ahead. 
Um, I actually, uh, what Natalie said is spot on, uh, absolutely spot on. We have to learn to love ourselves. The future of Bridgeport is with the, uh, the youth of, the, of this community. And, um, you know, and I, they are, and, and I see everywhere I go, uh, and Natalie is a wonderful example of that, they're, they're, they're enriching this community. The other thing that I think that I see happening here that, and again, I, I point to youth, is I, am, I do live downtown. And I see the renovations that are going on to a lot of these buildings that have been derelict and abandoned mm. uh, downtown. They're being turned into apartment buildings. And young people are moving into them, okay? And uh, with that is going to come a desire to, um, you know, to have the, the, boutique, the boutique shops, the antique shops or restaurants and things of that nature. It's, it's a lot of it is like the chicken and the egg, uh, mm -hmm. what came first. But I do believe having a population that lives here, okay, and, 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 and not only just sleeps here, but lives here is the key. And, uh, and because when that happens, then you're going to see a more vitalized downtown and then when the downtown becomes more vitalized, then to Virginia's point, I'm sure the, uh, the, our surrounding communities will be uh, venturing in if, uh, eventually. But to Natalie's point, if they don't, that shouldn't determine our future. We need to be self-determinant uh, as a community uh, to revitalize our city. As Natalie said, they, they used it, abused it, and handed it back to us broken. It's up to us who are here uh, to uh, to make the best of it and to repair it. Uh, so I I think that and and I think we're on the road to doing that. Just looking at the uh, the renovations of of of, um, of living space here in downtown and also in the factories that are now along the um, 95. They're turning into lofts and what have you. We're slowly going to get there. Uh, I know it's been a long time coming, but I think for the first time in a long time, there is a uh, tremendous momentum. Mm -hmm. Does any of the other panelists want to jump in on that question? All right, otherwise, I'm happy to take another question from the audience. Um, or we can we can just wrap up. Um, we are past our our time estimate um, that we originally gave you, so I will I will wrap this up. But I am going to hand this back to our panelists. If you have any more comments that you would like to make to this group, um, to the wider audience, uh, I, I invite you to make any any final comments. I, have, I just want to say I had a terrific, uh, a terrific time. Um, it was very enjoyable. I loved meeting all of you, and um, thank you for um, uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, panel. Yeah. And to so, follow up on that, I feel the same. Thank you very much. This was a really, really great experience, and I just feel so inspired by hearing everyone um, and having such a great group. So thank you. So and let's I, continue. Let's continue this, right? I would like to thank everyone. Um, um, I just want to remind you to be fragile like a flower or fragile like a bomb. Make your choice. Um, share your shine. And this is not a time to quit. This is a time to keep moving forward and just be sure to take someone with you and inspire someone. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a humbling, awesome experience. Thank you. And to close out, I just wanna let you all know that um, growth is in the uncomfortableness, right? You should, only be uncom you should only be comfortable in your bed, your shoes, in your car, in your clothes. But when we're growing professionally in our careers, you should welcome the challenges, welcome the opportunities, take dive into the unknown and just be make sure it's not dangerous you know like don't dive into something that's dangerous okay right but you know be very intentional uh and create those tables that you want 
to be able to move things forward in. And do not wait for people to invite you to their table to take action. We can all, Lauren and I, we have initiative coffees every week. And we sit here and we play with downtown like it's a canvas so that we can do activities, have fun, be intentional with your work. All right? And I think um, everyone, um, it was great. I enjoyed it, even though I was late. But um, we have to take a leap of faith. You know, if you believe in yourself and you're, with whatever you believe and what you want to do, there's nothing, there's nothing that stop you, except for bureaucrats and whoever. But you know mm -hmm. what? Now for us getting a um, um, a female vice president. So, you know, I thank everyone for and the women on this panel. And um, it was really great. Thank you. Once again, I, I wish to uh, echo what all of the other uh, panelists have uh, offered. Um, there, uh, there's been incredible wisdom shared this evening by all, and um, it's been an honor to be amongst you, a true honor to be amongst you. And if I had to leave a thought, I would say that each of our journeys is one step at a time. Uh, just keep making that a forward step. Uh, just It doesn't matter if it's a big leap or a tiny little tiptoe, uh, as long as it's forward. Try to treat, every, try to treat your momentum forward as, as crossing a Rubicon, uh, that you're not going to retreat from your progress, from your convictions for what it is that you want to achieve in life. Um, you know, that you, it, you're always caught crossing that Rubicon of never turning back, always moving forward. Just keep one step in front of the other and um, you will realize uh, what it is that's within you. And, um, and that's all I can, um, and that's my parting statement. Thank you. Well, thank you all again so much for your time today, um, for being here and, and sharing your wisdom. Uh, Lauren, do you have any final thoughts? Um, Thank you everyone for coming. I'll say uh, join Women's Leadership Network. I'm a member of that personally, professionally, and it's a fantastic community of powerful women who you see here and we've heard from and who joined our event today. Um, also follow us at Colorful Bridgeport um, on all your favorite social media channels <laughs> um, to keep hearing more about great um, people, places, things, events, activities in downtown and um, just thank you to everyone participating in the event tonight. Um, you know, it says a lot that from seven to eight thirty at night um, on a Wednesday uh, we close out Women's History Month so strong. So thank you, and um, hope to stay in touch. All right, thank thanks. You. Good night, all. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.